welcome back to the show where we are discussing all things mental health well-being in the workplace and pretty much at home. Things that you can implement into your own life as well. And we have by us on this sofa Dr. Bissy Lanian, who is a clinical psychologist and adult specialist of Sage Clinics. Uh, doctor, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I mean, we spoke about it a bit earlier, stress, burnout, such a I mean, hot relevant topic and I say that but it's so consistent throughout life no matter what you do where you are uh, tell me when people come to you uh, and come to see you for your specialties what is the first thing you address with them when it comes to this particular stress and burnout so when it comes to stress and burnout one of the main things that we want to be addressing is the physical symptoms so some of the physical exhaustion um, that comes with being burnt out and then we usually dig a little bit deeper mm -hmm. to actually find out what has led to this burnout in the first place. For some people, it's negative thoughts, it's this feeling that I'm just not good enough, mm -hmm. therefore I need to push myself and constantly push myself. And unfortunately, they've pushed themselves to a point where they're at total burnout. Uh, we, we spoke about the Sunday scaries, which was kind of a physical mm. symptom. Can you, can you just point out those physical symptoms that you do talk to them about? Yes, so some people um, experience that fatigue, mm -hmm. so extreme fatigue. Um, some people have also described this feeling of doom that often sits in the pit of the stomach. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people get that on the Sunday, yeah, mm -hmm. as they're thinking about, I've got to go into the office the next day. Um, other symptoms include headaches, frequent headaches, um, muscle tension, so holding all that stress in the body. The muscle starts to remember that mm -hmm. and it struggles to relax. Yeah. Dr. Bissy, I'm actually interested, as you're a psychologist, mm -hmm. what, I mean, I mean, I know everyone's different, but are there any sort of connections as to why people overwork themselves? Is there a certain type of personality, a certain ch type of childhood trauma that makes people push that hard? Yeah, so it depends. So when we um, work with individuals at Sage Clinics, we tend to do it on a very personalised, um, in a personalised way. So for some people, uh, maybe they grew up in very critical home environments. So that kind of environment started to plant seeds of not being good enough. Um, of, and that can often lead to really high expectations. And in the workplace, that manifests as going above and beyond all the time. Because they sort of see their boss as the authority figure of their childhood, right? Yeah. And also the culture mm. of the workplace as an authority figure, something that I have to almost um, submit to. Mm. Yeah. How important is it for leaders to have that kind of conversation with themselves though? I mean, I'm happy to say that uh, recently I, I was going through therapy um, and they were teaching me about self-compassion because the language that I've used to myself in the past has been, you know, you're a loser, again, connected to imposter syndrome. How important is it for the people that come and see you to actually kind of go on that journey of self-compassion? It's really important. I say to my clients that we are our constant. I'm always going to be busy, no matter where I am. I'm always going to be busy. So the way I relate to myself is the most important. My inner voice is the most important voice because it's the voice that's always going to be with me. And if you have an inner voice that's critical, that's berating, that's constantly putting you down, you're not gonna be productive. You're not gonna succeed Toxic at work. Toxic relationship. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So when we think of compassion, and there are lots of misconceptions about compassion. People think that if you're compassionate to yourself, you're weak. If you're compassionate, especially in the workplace, that that would lead to complacency. But that's not true. When we think about being compassionate towards ourselves, it actually takes a lot of courage. It takes courage to face those parts of you that are difficult. Yeah, so it takes a lot of courage to be compassionate to yourself. And it's something that we work um, very well and very closely with our clients. So doctor, maybe some of our viewers don't have access to a psychologist or a therapist. Are there any small tips that you can give to our viewers and maybe to us on the couch that we can kind of um, put into our own life and to help that more positive mindset and so we don't have that mental breakdown and burnout? Absolutely. So um, going on from the way we talk to ourselves, just pay attention to the way you speak to yourself. Are you a bully to yourself? Are you quite mean to yourself? and challenge that. Speak to yourself in a more kind way. Speak to yourself in the way that you would speak to someone that you love, someone that you care about if they were struggling. And other things that people can do on a more practical level is establish routines. Yeah, so self-care. 
you want to introduce self-care back into your life for, because for a lot of people that's often neglected and when we think of self-care I'm not talking about spa days I'm not talking about trips to the Maldives I'm talking about sleeping yeah I'm talking about eating well having a balanced diet I'm talking about exercise I'm talking about um, connecting with others with friends with family I'm talking about pursuing hobbies, things that you're interested in. Um, so having a routine is a good way to help you feel physically safe and also emotionally safe. I was just going to pick up on that. You talked about exercise, because obviously right now in Dubai, we've got the Fitness Challenge. Mm -hmm. And we actually wrote a report on the Fitness Challenge last year about how, how, how much improvement there was in people's mental health that had engaged with that Fitness Challenge. What's the difference that exercise, because that's, the, that's something we can all do for free, What's the difference that I can make? So when we move our body, and especially when we're exercising, it releases positive hormones and positive, um, what we would call like neurotransmitters. So it's a natural way to give yourself that kick. And also think about setting yourself, maybe a small goal of going for a walk. You also feel a sense of accomplishment and a sense of achievement. You've done something for yourself. And then also there are the physical health benefits of just generally moving your body. And if we're thinking about how stress is stored in the body with muscle tensions, things like yoga, stretching, those kind of exercises really help to release the body from a lot of tension that it carries. Dr. Bessie, we could talk to you for ages, <laughs> all right, because we all need free therapy, but thank you so much <laughs> for coming on to the show and we hope to have you on again. Thank you. All right, but for right now, we move on to our spotlight, which is about a founder who's on a mission to create growth and laughter in the workplace. It's time to meet Lily Karawala from the Happy Wealthy Lily Universe. Check this out. My name is Lily and the name of my business is Happy Wealthy Lily. That's also my website. And it's about being happy, choosing happiness, wealthy being the wealth of our being, and Lily, that's my name. Bring in more happiness and lightness. And that doesn't mean forgetting about what's really happening, but it's about uh, energy flows where attention goes. So what we focus on is what we build greater. Uh, quite a few have done laughter yoga with corporates uh, along with their global leaders. I've done with uh, school children. Also, I have another program which is to do with de-stress and defragment and bring about a positive change the way you look at life. To be honest, I don't see this as a challenge as such. I mean, I'm choosing to spread happiness and spread positivity. And if someone's not choosing it, it's their choice. Whoever chooses comes along. To see laughter, happiness and joy as a front page news on every single media. I love Dubai in the first aspect is that it's got great respect for family culture. That's one. And uh, it is a melting pot of different nationalities. It's the, on a global scale, it's between the Western world and the Asian. So it's more than 200 nationalities that we have over here. Well, it's now time for the roundup. So, Nimi, what's the buzz in town? Mm -hmm. Well, I will tell you. The roundup is all about UAE employees likely to switch jobs for better benefits over a salary. So, the stat is 89% of UAE employees would switch jobs for the same salary if the benefits were better, according to the YouGov survey. Uh, Scott, I guess you're the best person uh, to ask about this. Do you see that as, as a very, very much a likelihood? And my first question would be, what do benefits mean? Outside of salary, that can be anything from an EAP that provides mental health treatment. It's interesting because there was a massive survey by Michael Page, which was a recruitment company, and they said that 55% of applicants in the UEE were walking in and going, what's your mental health policy to the employers wow. during interview. So there's a very much change in dynamic where employees are walking into interviews and going, okay, 
the other one of course is flexibility not necessarily not being in the office but the flexibility to work from home at some times the, to work from different locations to go away on uh, you know to work from any location around the world there are companies um, who uh, shortlisted in, in our awards that offer unlimited leave um, and they kind of live almost like to an honesty system for the for the employees to take as much time off as they want but knowing that they've still got to be productive. And I have heard though, Scott, that with those experiments with the unlimited leave, people were taking less leave than they would if they just had annual days. Absolutely. There was a band that once released an album that said, uh, pay what you like for it. And in the end, they made more money than they would have done the usual way. So yeah, it's interesting. There's all these different um, ways of addressing this. I think the UK had a massive uh, trial around the four day week. Um, and when they finished the four day week, 85% of the companies that were involved in it reported higher productivity, lower absenteeism, lower presenteeism, um, and higher talent retention. So we see this increasingly, and I think statistics like this are a wake-up call for employers, particularly when we look at Gen Z. We know that Gen Z, well, people who look like me of my age will roll their eyes and go, well, we were miserable, they should be miserable too. Well, no, maybe there's a better way of doing things. But also, we know that they're prepared to change jobs more quickly. And if, we, if employees want to keep the talent, they're going to have to start leaning into Gen Z because Gen Z are quite firmly saying, we prioritize ourselves more than a wage. I think they'd probably take a job with better benefits even if there was a lower salary. I know I would. Yeah. We're seeing it. The, the, again, that Cigna Vitality uh, research has literally just came out said that I think it was like 66% of the respondents now prioritise time with themselves over a better paid job. So it, it, how much more research do we want? Because yeah. <laughs> you know, things have changed, guys. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a little break now on DXB today. But coming up, don't forget, we do have a performance from Sean Lipsy. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 